Hello guys, this is me, Dr. JK, and today we'll discuss about odontogenic tumors. Odontogenic tumors consist of uh, benign tumors and malignant tumors. In benign tumors, it may consist of tumors that arises from the odontogenic epithelium without odontogenic ectomies and chyme, and it may include ameloblastoma, calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor that is also known as the Pinberg tumor because it was described by J.J. Pinberg in 1956. Then we have squamous odontogenic tumor and adenomatite odontogenic tumor. Today we will discuss about ameloblastoma. Okay? Uh, it is most common clinically a uh, significant odontogenic tumor. It arises from the odontogenic epithelium as we have mentioned here without odontogenic ectomies and chyme. Uh, theoretically it may arise from the rest of dental lamina, from a developing enamel organ, from the epithelial lining of an, an odont odontogenic cyst or from the basal cells of the oral mucosa. It is generally slow growing, locally invasive and it runs benign course in most cases. There are three types um, if you talk about clinical and radiographic features of ameloblastoma and it is conventional solid or multi-cystic it is about 86% of all cases. Then we have unicystic which is about 13% of all cases and the last one is peripheral that is extra osseous about 1% of all cases. So for we will discuss about conventional solid or multi-cystic ameloblastoma here. And if we, if we talk about clinical feature, it has a wide age range. It is most commonly present in children younger than age 10 and relatively uncommon in the 10 to 19 year old group. There is no any sex predilection in ameloblastoma. Some studies indicate greater frequency in blacks. Other show shows you know no racial predilection. 80 to 85 percent of conventional ameloblastomas are present in the mandible and most often in the molar ascending ramus area. Whereas 15 to 20 percent of ameloblastoma occur in maxilla, usually in the posterior region. So, you know, ameloblastoma is most commonly present in mandible, and in mandible, it is present in the posterior area. This is the figure, uh, you know, this is the image which, which can shows, uh, show us about the different percentages uh, as far as the anatomic area is concerned. So, it is most commonly present in the mandible and in the posterior area of the mandible. Okay, now we'll discuss about clinical features. It is mostly asymptomatic and it is, you know, diagnosed on the routine radiographic examination if the lesion is small. A painless swelling or expansion of the jaw is the usual clinical presentation. If untreated, then the lesion may grow slowly to the massive lesion as shown here, okay. Here we can see it is present in the anterior part of the mandible and if uh, it is untreated, then it may become a larger, you know, lesion. And uh, one important thing about ameloblastoma is that pain and paresthesia are uncommon even with large tumors. So this is a very important point. You should remember this point. And if you talk about radiographic features, if the locules of the multilocular radiolucency is small, uh, is larger, it will show so bubble appearance. Here we can see, you know, the ameloblastoma is most commonly present has multi-cystic uh, radiolucencies. Okay. And uh, if the, these locules are larger in size, it will show, you know, uh, it will show so bubble appearance like this. And if they are smaller in size, as shown here, smaller in size, these locules are smaller in size, it will show honeycomb appearance, okay? And it may uh, lead to the resorption of uh, the roots of the teeth if the teeth are associated with it and it may lead to the buccal and nigual cortical expansion. In many cases, uh, an unerupted tooth, uh, most often a mandibular third molar is associated with the ameloblastoma. And if we talk about radiolucencies, then it is mostly, most commonly multilocular uh, lesion. And sometimes it may be present as unilocular radiolucency, okay? And the margins are irregular uh, scalloping. The margins will be having irregular scalloping okay these are the images which we have discussed here you can see uh, it is present this is the you know occlusal view of the mandible and this is the radiolucent area this is the ameloplastoma present at the anterior part of the mandible here we can see and here we can see the resorption of the roots okay the associated teeth will be having resorption of roots and yes, if the you know ameloblastoma is smaller in size and is present between the roots of the teeth, uh, so it may be confused with lateral periodontal cyst. This is in fact ameloblastoma, but it may be confused with lateral periodontal cyst. 
Okay, one, uh, you know, other feature of the amyloblastoma is desmoplastic, which is different than that of the conventional amyloblastoma. One form of amyloblastoma that does not have these characteristic features is the desmoplastic amyloblastoma. The desmoplastic amyloblastoma has a marked predilection to occur in the anterior region of the jaws, particularly the maxilla. Okay, so uh, the conventional amyloblastoma is most commonly present in the mandible, and in the mandible, it was most common. Uh, commonly present in the posterior area, but here the desmoplastic amyloblastoma is most commonly present in the anterior region of the maxilla. If we talk about radiographic features, you know, it resembles a fibrosis lesion because of its mixed radiolucent and radio opaque appearance. This mixed radiographic appearance is due to osseous metaplasia within the dense fibrous septa that uh, you know characterize the lesion, not because the tumor itself is producing a mineralized product. So that is because of osseous metaplasia. Here we can see this is a lesion present at the uh, body and the interior area of the mandible. And here you can see radiolucent area and these are the radio opaque area. So it is a mixed lesion. The desmoplastic amyloblastoma is a mixed lesion. That is why it resembles fibrosseous lesions, which are also mixed lesions. Okay. And if you talk about histopathological features, there are several microscopic subtypes of conventional amyloblastoma, you know, but these microscopic patterns generally have little bearing uh, on the behavior of the tumor. Large tumors often uh, show a combination of uh, microscopic patterns. The follicular and plexiform patterns are most common. So uh, on the first number is follicular, it is most common, and then second is the plexiform pattern okay then less common histopathological patterns include the acanthomatous granular cell desmoplastic and basal cell types we will discuss about all these uh, uh, you know subtypes uh, one by one first we have follicular pattern it is the most common and recognizable pattern there will be island of epithelium that resemble enamel organ epithelium in a mature fibrous connective tissue stroma the epithelial nest consists of core of loosely arranged angular cells resembling the stellate reticulum of an enamel organ. A single layer of tall columnar amyloblast-like cells surrounds this central core. The nuclei of these cells are located at the opposite pole to the basement membrane and sh so it will show reverse polarity. Okay? Cis formation is common which you know form within the epithelial islands. Okay? The cysts will form in the epithelial islands. And if you talk about the plexiform pattern, a pattern, then it is, you know, it shows long anastomosing cords or larger sheets of the odontogenic epithelium. The cords or sheets of epithelium are bounded by columnar or cuboidal amyloplast-like cells surrounding more loosely arranged epithelial cells. The supporting stroma tends to be loosely arranged and vascular, and, you know, cyst formation is rel relatively uncommon, and it will be present in the connective tissue rather than cystic changes within the epithelium. In the follicular type, the cystic changes were there in the epithelium, whereas in the plexiform pattern, it will be in the connective tissue rather than inside the epithelium. And here we have, you know, uh, we had, you know, different islands and uh, nests of the uh, epithelium were there. And here in plexiform pattern, we have sheets or cords of the epithelium. Okay, then we have acanthomatous pattern. It is, you know, uh, the, it will have extensive squamous metaplasia and often they are associated with keratin formation and uh, in the central portion okay in the central portion they will be having keratin formation uh, and they will have extensive squamous metaplasia okay uh, this change does not indicate a, a more aggressive course for the lesion histopathologically however such a lesion may be confused with the squamous cell carcinoma or squamous cell antigenic tumor so remember if you talk about acanthomatous pattern there will be extensive squamous metaplasia there will be keratin formation in the central portion of the epithelial island okay of the follicular follicular amyloblastoma so it means if we talk about acanthomatous pattern okay acanthomatous pattern it will look like follicular uh, follicular amyloblastoma but there will be squamous metaplasia and there will be you know uh, keratin formation at the central portion of the epithelial islands this is the difference between the follicular type and the acanthomatous pattern then we have granular cell pattern there will be you know uh, the, the group of lesional epithelial cells will be converted to the granular cells these cells have abundant cytoplasm filled with eosinophilic granules that resemble lysosome ultrastructurally and histochemically. Okay? 
they are clinically aggressive tumors and they are present most commonly in young, young patients okay if uh, uh, you know a question comes uh, which form of the uh, histolo histopathological form of the amyloblastoma is more aggressive than it will be uh, you know a granular pattern and it is most common in young patients then we have desmoplastic pattern this type of amyloblastoma contains small island and cores of odontogenic epithelium in densely collagenized stroma so uh, the you know stroma will be densely collagenized and it will you know it looks like that it will shrink those uh, islands and cores okay so that is how the desmoplastic pattern is then we have basal cell pattern it is most you know resembles that of the basal cell carcinoma it is least common type nests of uniform basal cells are there and they histopathologically are very similar to the basal cell carcinoma of the skin and no stellate reticulum is present in the central portions of the nest the peripheral cells about the nest tend to be cuboidal rather than columnar so these were the different you know histopathological uh, types or subtypes of the amyloblastoma now we'll discuss about treatment uh, amyloblastoma generally is, is slow growing but locally invasive tumors and have a high recurrence rate after treatment lesions of the mandible are often aggressive and subsequently perf uh, perforate the cortical bone tumor you know normally extends beyond radiographic margins in cancellous bone but not at the cortical margin curettage of amyloblastoma which was favored in the past is now not advocated because of the high recurrence rate associated with it residual tumor cells will likely be left at the tumor to bone margin following curettage so curettage should not be done if we talk about amyloblastoma uh, best if we we want best treatment that it is through the resection of the lesion with a marginal clearance of uh, 1.5 to 2 cm of normal bone to prevent recurrence and it may be resected has a block resection with or without continuity defect based on the integrity of inferior cortex if you do not want any continuity defect then 1 cm bone should be there okay if you do not want continuity defects okay radiographically a minimum of 1 cm residual mandible inferior cortex is required post operatively to prevent pathological fracture so this point is again very important 1 cm residual mandible inferior cortex is required if you want you know to prevent pathological fractures post operatively inferior alveolar nerve should be sacrificed if it lies within the lesion okay this is again very important point if you talk about uh, the inferior alveolar nerve then they should be sacrificed and extension into the soft tissue when it becomes difficult to define the tumor margins and vital structures may be uh, in danger so amyloblastoma sometimes they you know extend into the soft tissues and it will be difficult to define the tumor margins and it may lead to you know vital structures will be endangered maxillary amyloblastomas are particularly dangerous partly uh, because the bones uh, are considerably thinner than those of the mandible and present less effective barrier to spread therefore radical excision is essential Uh, preferably maxillectomy okay so if we talk about maxilla then it will be particularly dangerous and we will have to do maxillectomy okay and uh, so we have to do radical excision and that should be maxillectomy okay if you talk about peripheral amyloblastoma then we have to do excision as usually there is no alveolar bone involvement if prior biopsy indicates involvement of bone block resection with continuity defect is the choice of treatment If we talk about prognosis then recurrence rate of 10 to 20% have been reported after enucleation and curettage of unicystic amyloblastoma and a recurrence rate of 15% is reported after marginal resection of conventional amyloblastoma so better to choose you know uh, the uh, resection than uh, to choose the enucleation and curettage these are the references of uh, this lecture hopefully you enjoyed my lecture so if you enjoy my lecture please subscribe to my channel and we will make more videos on oral pathology so till my next lecture take care and bye bye